Hello, welcome everyone to another wonderful Sales Hacker live event. Very excited because we've got an incredible crew, accomplished sales leaders and coaches at Replays to talk about uh, building a data-driven sales coaching culture. So I'm excited to learn how high growth companies are using data to hire, how to maximize call coaching, um, and especially seeing the replays insights data on what exactly happens on deals that were closed one versus deals that didn't make it past the first call. So it's going to be a very actionable conversation, and I'm going to introduce you to your host in just a moment, but we're going to give folks a few minutes to roll in. So let's get the chat um, kicked off. Open up your chat box, introduce yourself, tell us your name, your title, where you're, where you're coming from, share your LinkedIn link if you want. This is a fun, a cool time to network. Um, if, you're, if your chat is currently set to hosts and panelists, make sure you switch it to everyone. Otherwise, um, just our, pan our panel will see it. We want everyone to see it. So uh, when you have questions today, we've got a Q&A box. So leave that open as well. We want all your questions. We're not here to talk at you. This is a conversation and we want to address the things that you want to talk about. So um, without further ado, thank you so much to everyone that has joined so far. The fantastic Karen Kelly, CEO of K2 Performance Consulting and Replays Coach is going to facilitate this discussion. So Karen, thank you so much for being here. Um, would you like to introduce yourself and then I'll let you take it away with introducing the panel and our topic. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sam, and delighted to be with you all today. As Sam said, my name is Karen Kelly. Uh, I run uh, K2 Performance Consulting, sales training, consulting, and coaching, and I'm also a replace coach. So delighted to be moderating this, this uh, uh, masterclass today, as well as offering commentary where possible. And again, when you think about the timing of this, you know, data and science could never play a more important role than it really does today to allow us to get to that first stage of awareness. And beyond that, you know, we, uh, we have something to move towards. So before we get uh, going, as Samantha said, I'd invite you to in the chat box, let us know uh, where you're calling in from. And um, because this is geared for both sales leaders and um, sales enablement and sales reps, let us know what your role is so we can gear the conversation to, uh, and really make it a tailored experience. Uh, so again, delighted to be moderating this and uh, love to welcome the two panelists here. So we'll begin with Dave Kennett, uh, CEO of, of Replace and Keith Abramson, uh, VP of Sales of Electronique. So Dave, why don't you start by giving us a quick introduction and let us know a little bit about who Replace is. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Karen. Hi, everyone. Really excited that you're here today, and we want to make the most of your time, so I won't spend too much time on an intro. Um, I uh, started Replays about three years ago, and we work exclusively with high-growth SaaS organizations to um, really help improve their sales process from an AE perspective uh, for discoveries, demos, for SDRs in terms of booking more meetings. And what we've done is we've listened to literally uh, with our coaching team of 24 coaches, We've listened to thousands of calls now, some of the highest growth SaaS companies, and we want to share some of those insights with you today. Uh, we literally have a, a data insights and scoring team. We jump into Gong and Chorus and, and find meaningful insights about what are, the, what are the deals, you know, when a deal moves forward of the last 200 calls that we analyzed, why did it move forward, we think, versus the, the ones that didn't? What are the commonalities? So that's what we're going to share with you today. Thanks, Dave. And Keith. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. My name is Keith Abramson. I am VP of Sales at a hyper growth, hyper automation startup. Our journey has been a wild one. And uh, I was employee, I believe I was employee number 40 or so, and the first North American hire. And my oversight of my org has now grown to will be up above 90 individuals in the revenue org about 12 months later and a global team pushing 200 plus. So hyper growth to say the least, and also a very proud replays coach. Awesome. Thank you so much, Keith and Dave. Uh, just looking at the chat where we're getting people in from, we, it looks like uh, Canada is representing, which is uh, awesome. <laughs> And um, Atlanta, we have a mix. There's some VPs here. There's some individual contributors, which is great because just 
what Dave said, you know, if you're wondering both from a sales leader and a sales rep standpoint, you know, why are my deals stalling at certain point? And, you know, the data and the science are going to support that. But, you know, sometimes it, against our best efforts, we're unsure. So it's, I'm excited to see a lot of um, how this is going to go and kind of what you can take away from this, both as an individual contributor, as well as a sales leader. So um, we're going to start by, you know, really looking when you look at the journey and how coaching and data can play a role. It all starts at, you know, that first introductory role of the hiring process. And we know right now, you know, there's something, a lot of stuff going on with the great resignation and a lot of, a lot of talent, but, you know, a lot, not a lot of spots. And so the barrier to entry is, is, is low right now. So I want to just start and um, we're going to talk about how leaders of high growth SaaS companies use data and science to hire better, faster and scale. So in order to do that, I want to just ask Sam to run the first poll so we can just get engage the audience as to what they are seeing. So Sam, would you go ahead and launch that first poll? Thank you. So when you see the poll, you can go ahead and, and answer it. This is an interesting one, Karen. I, I'm not surprised by it. Look, it looks like it's skewing significantly towards the no, there isn't a ton of um, sort of, uh, there, there aren't aptitude tests used before a candidate starts with an organization. Mm -hmm. So 64 so far is saying no, we have a, a few seconds left on the clock. You know, when you think about that hiring phase, you know, it's always a risk, right? It's a 50-50. So the fact that uh, we're not using anything and 65% of you are saying that we're not, you know, really asks us the question, what can we be doing to, to you know, to get that insights and, and looking at their ability to learn? What's their chance of success? So are you surprised by this, Dave? You're saying you're not with 65% of not using um, any kind of aptitude tests in that hiring process. No, not at all. And I don't think it's necessarily intuitive for us to do that, right? I, I uh, for, you know, leaders to say, hey, let's throw a test out there. You know, most of us have heard of DISC or MBTI or what have you, but um, there are very few organizations that actually provide um, insight. So um, the last thing I want today to be is a sales um, pitch for replace. Um, so I'm going to share how we're sort of helping customers with this. And I want to be agnostic. If you can find another tool, that's great. That's awesome. Uh, but I just want to share what our customers are doing. So when we're talking with uh, CROs, uh, head of enablement uh, and rev ops every single day, high growth SaaS companies, and I, I'm getting pinged almost daily of, hey, we're looking for a new sales manager. We're looking for a new AE. We're looking for an SDR. Every single person on this call, I'm sure is familiar with um, the, the challenge of hiring right now and also retention. And uh, what we want to do is give the best uh, opportunity of someone to actually uh, be a retained employee, be someone that's actually the right fit as well. And so we use data not only for sales call coaching, but hiring. And uh, we've, we've, um, we use a pop uh, analysis that uh, literally has been used with 20 million sales reps so far, and it profiles out whether someone is red, yellow, green. And I mean, here's just a real quick example right here. It actually gives you the probability of success of in a sales role. I'm not gonna, you know, and the purpose isn't to sit here and, and go into that in detail. I encourage folks to use something like this. And, you know, it's like anything, it's a data point. We can't use that as the 100% North Star. But um, what I do encourage leaders to think about is profiling out their existing team and understanding, hey, is someone's natural preference to be, uh, you've asked them to be um, taking 15% of self-sourced leads themselves, going out and gathering 15 to 20% self-sourced leads, but that might not be their superpower. And you might be pushing Jello uphill by doing it. And so having these kind of tests to really understand what's their level of call reluctance, et cetera, profiling that out. And then when you go to hire someone as a final step, you get something like this done. And then you're using, you're using science uh, as a helper. So that's, uh, that's one thing I, I would recommend is, is being a little bit more uh, granular in, in assessing 
individuals once they get to the final step because it can be a real predictor of retention and, and, and a fantastic way to give self-awareness to individuals on your team, sharing results of tests like that. And um, you know, there's there are a handful of companies that do this out there. So again, I'm not sitting here uh, saying, "Hey, go go use replays." But I am encouraging folks to, especially in this market, to really think about being a little bit more uh, buttoned down on the on the data side. I think that's great. And I love the, even the profiling of the existing team because if you want to, you know, set them up for success, a lot of times you want to ensure that the skill set is, is aligned with the role. But also it kind of gives you that baseline so that when you're hiring new, you're aligning culture, you're seeing kind of what we already have and where there's an opportunity for a different skill set to kind of, you know, round out that sales team. Yep. Keith, what are you seeing in terms of what companies are doing uniquely or creatively to either attract or retain their sales team? So post COVID, of course, the, the massive wave was that everyone went remote. And there's a lot of dialogue of late. And uh, of course you have some of the individuals that are being deliberately provocative, but I think many of the individuals speaking and writing on this are homing in on a truism, which is that our entire modality has changed. So I know that individuals now are looking as one of their first criteria what do I have to do to work at this job? Not only have I grown accustomed to this remote work environment, I found the advantages and I love it and uh, it works for me. And uh, I'm finding that many of the employee employers that are not only fostering this, they're actively encouraging it and leaning in. It's one of the biggest competitive advantages right now. I would almost say it is the new price of entry for any AE gig is, I, I hear this perennially, is it remote? Do I have to actually go into an office? And uh, I've seen employers offering some really interesting perks around this, increasing use of stipends to furnish out that home office, some of the perks like helping employees set up the ideal home office environment the, the accoutrement from the microphone to the lighting, to the cameras, to, to the setups. And I'm seeing that I think far and beyond the biggest trend now is not just remote, but enablement of remote work and an adoption of the paradigm into not only what's accepted, but what's encouraged as not only a perk, but just a, a part of the new modality of work right now. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. And that's recognizing the standard of work. I mean, this is where we're at, right? And I think uh, the last stat I read was 92% of buyers prefer the virtual environment. So companies that are not adopting and aligning their sales team and, you know, throwing tech stack at them is not enough. So just like you said, Keith, giving them the lighting and allowing them to become experts and really create that experience for their customers and getting the support of their company, that's, that's a win-win. Absolutely. Okay, great points. Thanks for sharing, uh, folks. So we, we just talked briefly about data points in that initial hiring phase, because again, you know, it's 50-50. It's you think sometimes it's a gut and you've got a good fit and then you, you make the wrong hire and you look at, you know, the impact financially, um, you know, obviously there's a cost uh, culturally. So we, we kind of talked about how the data can really prevent us if we have some form of aptitude tests or rubrics there. Um, to ensure that we are getting the right person in that also aligns with the culture we've already established with our own team. And then when you go further along and you look at how can data support us in, um, you know, in coaching our, um, our sales team, because again, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And we're not, we're not always like, like he just said, we're not face to face anymore. So how are we sure of what actually is going on on these remote calls? Are they using best practices? Are they implementing the training that you know have given to them? So um, we're gonna throw out a second poll here, Sam, just to get a sense of the frequency as sales leaders, you're coaching your, your, your team. Call coaching. You know, this is one where I, I'm gonna guess that it's um, the, the vast majority of folks aren't having the, the chance to actually call coach their team frequently. It's one of those things where we're in such a fast paced environment these days with VC money flooding in there, high expectations and uh, a lot of new hires, but it's tough to do the thing that we all care about so much. 
Uh, so we're looking forward to giving some people some tips there. While we're waiting for this poll to come in, I'll also say I think a key to retention is and, and attracting great talent is really painting a picture of where the, you can take them for their career. How are you going to invest in them? How are you going to, you know, asking them, where, where do you want to be in three to five years? And really aligning uh, how you'll invest in them to get them there. And I know that sounds like a no-brainer to most of us on this call. There's a lot of senior leaders on this call today. And, um, but the question is, is it being done? You know, is it being, is it being measured? And is it something where um, you've got a commitment to them? Uh, and even if it, you don't have something in the budget, you know, mentor sessions quarterly with some mentor within the organization or externally. I mean, these are, are things that um, I think are easy wins that, that aren't necessarily being done outside of the, you know, because who wants to play the game of, yeah, we're, we're going to pay an SDR $180,000. That just doesn't make sense for, for anyone, right? Yeah, no, completely agree. So I see the results here. There's 43% are weekly. That started at 67, so it's it's balanced out. Uh, and thank you for your honesty for those who are almost never. I mean, there's no point in uh, in hiding behind it. There's, there's only one way to one way to go from there. Okay, so 43% are coaching weekly. 21, uh, 25 never, almost never. 21% are monthly, and 11% are biweekly. And just to echo what Dave just said, there is that when you look at sales teams, you know, they want to be some, they want to be part of something bigger and they want that sense of community and they want to belong and they want to win. But in order to win, they need to be coached. And the most recent that I read was 60% of sales um, reps are more likely to leave if their manager is a poor coach. So that's assuming they're coaching. So this is something that this data is showing us that they want. And just by this um, stat here, you know, less than 50% are actually doing it. So, um, you know, eye opener here, or maybe not. Let me just start with that, Dave. Is this uh, shocking uh, to you to see these numbers being what Replace does? It's improved over the last couple of years. You know, a couple of years ago, it would have been uh, 60 to 70% of folks would say a call is coached only once every uh, two months or so per rep. And that is a really, really good sign. And, and, and I'm glad to see it. I, I wanna speak uh, for a second to the folks who aren't getting around to it. Uh, it's probably despite your best efforts. And of course there's, there's you know, things that you can do internally. I wanna share best practices we see with companies where maybe you don't have the budget uh, to actually go and hire a sales coach or a sales training company. Um, creating a coaching culture, I think is about, you know, creating a safe environment, transparency, people can be vulnerable. You know, when you, you have calls and you're listening to calls together, making sure that, I guess, teaching your team on how to give respectful feedback to each other. But one thing I recommend is putting your team into thirds and uh, once a week having, uh, let's say you've got an, an AA team of, of 10 reps or maybe an SDR team of, of, of 10 reps, um, um, taking a few of them and one person plays the role of the buyer, one is playing the role of the seller and one is the observer. And um, you've got a specific area you're focusing in on that week could be understanding second level pain um, if you're an AE and for an SDR it, it might be hey what is the first 10 seconds of that call sound like um, and then coaching each other on it this is something that is going to allow you to get some repeats um, and, and really uh, won't cost you anything uh, but part of it is making making sure that you're floating around in these sessions as well as a leader and providing value. Uh, another good one is, let's say you're a sales rep on this call and you're like, hey, I, I wanna prove that I wanna get to that next stage, that next level. I wanna be team lead in uh, I, you know, sometime within this calendar year. Take initiative, right? That really matters. Put your hand up and say, next time there's a new hire, I wanna be an onboarding buddy or take initiative and actually listen to one of, you know, one of your calls per week and then send your assessment through to your leader, right? Have a listen to one of your recorded calls and gone chorus and then say, hey, my next one-on-one, -on -one, I, I want to uh, walk through what my debrief was on this. Uh, those are just a few, a few ideas that are low budget, uh, but very, very effective. Mm, thanks, Dave. And, and I agree with that. When you think about the specificity of that, those activities, they're aligned to the role. Right. So you have an emerging sales manager, you know, who you can empower to kind of start the call coaching and assume more responsibility. But then the role of an SDR is unique as well. So it's, it's great that you're not painting everyone with the same brush because their needs and their skill sets are completely different. 
and we want to hone them and uh, and advance them. Um, so thank you for those two. Keith, in your practice, is there any other, you know, kind of in the absence of, uh, you know, perhaps budget for sales training, uh, what could they do creatively with their internal resources just to build off with da uh, with uh, what Dave said? Anything you, you're coming across? Absolutely. So one that costs nothing except time and it's time well spent is to create the best practice video library and find a way to comb through that library of calls. Presumably, I would venture to guess, and I don't think it's a, a poll that's coming up until later, but I would presume a lot of the audience is using conversation intelligence. And one of the most valuable ways to leverage that massive data set is simply to harvest out known good and leverage that as part of onboarding training and build your confluence reference library of best cases so that when you're giving tactical feedback to a rep as part of their development and upskilling plan, you can point them to some references and enable them to do some self-study and some self-improvement as you're coaching them through it. Because oftentimes, and I, I've seen it happen so many times, a manager will guide a rep to do better at something and not actually offer the tactical guidance. And the rep is often embarrassed to even ask for the actual guidance. I've seen it happen whereby if you're an AE, you'll say, yeah, I know that was terrible. Well, do you actually know it was terrible and can you mm -hmm. actually improve it? But you're not going to ask on the spot for fear of looking not optimal. So I, I've seen it many, many times, having that well-built, robust library of optimal examples of objections of every single component of a first meeting or a demo call that's deemed critical to success, built and referenceable. Mm -hmm. I think that was a really, really great point, Keith, and I'm glad you brought it up because when you think about, you know, the, the newcomers versus those who can always um, improve, we need to know what excellent looks like. And so in the absence of that, we're assuming, and we're maybe, like you said, we're thinking it's, it's not that bad, but what are we comparing it against? And then, you know, when your manager might be pulling it across the line for you, how are we, how are we improving? And so back to what Dave said is also, you know, how can you create a safe space so that you can disarm, you can, as a leader, you can show your vulnerability and say like, I, I didn't start where I was and just create that relatability that when they are unsure that there's an open forum for them to come to you. You know, there's trust, you're disarming and you're kind of creating a culture of transparency. And so I, I think too often when we give this illusion that we have all the answers and we know everything and someone who's coming in does not, they're like, well, I, I can't relate to you because I know I don't know everything. So how are we alike? So I think that's a really great point is to just how can we embrace vulnerability um, to invite our team to come to us? And 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 work, that for me is that first step of, of being okay and agreeing to coaching. Someone here, Chad just says, as someone in enablement, I would challenge people to make sure they are differentiating coaching and saving the day when listening in on calls. And yes, Chad, what a great point, just saving the day or bringing it across the line, because you know what, that, that serves one thing, and, and that's usually the ego of the sales leader, unfortunately. And you look at, is it, is it creating a, a behavioral change? Is there awareness in what they did differently? And it's not. And so if we're trying to upskill our, our team, improve their and heighten their self-awareness. So next time they're in a situation like that, they know what to do. They're not because we've spoon fed them. So great point. Thank you for um, bringing that up, Chad. Sometimes you got to let them fly it into the mountain. <laughs> yeah. I mean, embrace failure too, right? Because failure is the ability to try. Yeah. One thing I want to mention on, on the uh, recordings so just piggybacking on what Keith said, I, I see, so almost every single one of our customers uses a conversational intelligence recording tool, uh, whether it's Gong, Chorus, um, or, um, you know, Outreach, et cetera. And, and they're all they're, you know, great tools, but um, they have a, a library option on there. And most of our customers don't use that library. Uh, or what they'll do is they'll say, hey, here's a great job um, of Joe or Joanne doing a great call. And no one's going to listen to a 45 minute call. Uh, so what, what we're doing now to really help um, evolve that is and, and help new reps ramp faster is 
our scoring team goes in and we look at four out of four examples of a sales skill. Here's a four out of four example of top rep doing a great customer story or a good example of someone getting a next meeting on the books. And now they're 30 second to one and a half snippets of highlight reels by sales stage. And so I really encourage um, the folks on the call here to, um, to do that, to um, ask their team if, if, if their sales rep thinks that they absolutely crushed it in um, a specific sales school uh, or sales skill might just be doing a really good agenda. It might be un uncovering second level pain, just taking snippets because that is something that people will actually take time, uh, take time to listen to. Yeah, great points there, Dave. Um, anything you'd like to add there, Keith? I would agree and endorse everything that Dave is saying on that one. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> You know. It really, it really does depend, though, on people having a framework that they're coaching to, right? So my question to everyone on this, um, on this call right now is, you know, what does success look like? Do you have a framework for your discovery calls for your team? Um, if you're, a, you know, a, a CRO or head of enablement, you know, have you got a framework for what that demo should look like and sound like? If you're a sales leader, um, a sales manager, and and you you don't have that today. Um, is it something that you're actively working on and bringing to your leader? If you're a sales rep and you don't have that, are you being part of the solution? Um, again, put your hand up. Be be the first one that your leader thinks of as a team lead um, and, and say, hey, I see we don't have a discovery call framework. Here are the top 10 questions I ask that seem to resonate with this persona and this persona and start putting those documents together. It's, it's, um, it's one of those things where it all starts with a framework, which I think leads into our next poll, Karen. It, it does. And before that, I'm just going to throw it out in the chat box, because like you said, Dave, you know, we have to take an initiative. And even if there are individual contributors trying to move into that management role, that's a great initiative there as to how can I create a framework? So in the chat box, let me know if you are using a framework uh, or let us know if you're using a framework. And if you are, is it for discovery? Is it for coaching? Is it demo? So we can just get a sense of what's going on. And are you actually scoring calls? That's what this question is is uh, I'm super interested to learn here because you look at um, a lot of organizations I talk to like, oh yeah, we've been meaning to build a scorecard for a while, uh, but we just don't have time or we can't sync on what a good scorecard looks like. Or uh, I just feel like a scorecard's useless because five people are gonna fill it out five different ways. And so I think it's interesting to spend a minute on this. I think it's un uncharted waters for a lot of organizations, yet I think it's necessary. Like if we're going to define success, how do we define it? And then how do we actually measure to that? So you can jump into a CI tool and listen to calls, but you don't know if it was a great call or not until you've actually listened to it or you've looked at a scorecard. So, you know, I'm really curious. This is back to the data side of things. I'm curious how people are doing this today. Okay. Well, so far, 68% of them are not using a scorecard for the recorded calls. Okay. And again, 43% are, are not coaching weekly either. So, <laughs> Well, and as we're waiting for, uh, for the results to fully come in, I, I would, I'll share this. We actually have a scoring team, uh, and, and I encourage you to do the same internally, um, but we will score calls for companies, and our data science team will give insights. I mean, anyone can score calls. It's what you do with that data. And I tell you, we find the most interesting things. So like after we've scored the calls, we put them into a document like this and we're like, wow, across the last hundred calls um, in Justin's team versus Christine's team, look at the difference in how they handled um, asking the budget question or what have you. And so to the leaders that are on the call today, I would ask, you know, let's say for the, the CROs, uh, do you have a real good sense as to what sales team A is doing as a strength versus sales team B versus sales team C? And, and um, and how they can learn from each other. You know, so we had a customer recently who their EMEA team was really good at these three things. Their North America team was good at these three things, but they actually didn't know that until we rolled up the data from scoring these calls. How could you possibly know it? I've been a tech leader for years. I, I couldn't get that data. Gong's not going to tell you. Um, and, and again, Gong's great, uh, but that's not its purpose, right? So um, this, this whole idea of, uh, of using a rubric or a scorecard um, I think is something that is an opportunity for us as a collective sales community to, to get better at. I think that's great. And 74% Dave are not using a scorecard uh, for recorded sales calls. So um, 
opportunity there. And just to echo what some people in the chat are saying is Charles says scorecard makes coaching way more objective too. Yes. You know, it holds us accountable, but it's the data doesn't lie. It's black or white. So I think that's a great point. Um, I'm also curious if orgs are using formal training that defines the framework. What are your thoughts there, uh, Dave or Keith? Again, we kind of ask people if they are using a, a framework. Um, so I think that's actually one of the hesitations here is that there's some trepidation about being wrong on setting up the scoring parameters. And I would actively encourage all of those 74% and taking that as representative of the sales community at large, that 74% of sales leaders, something is far, far better than nothing here. And again, I, I know that a lot of us feel that our subjective value is our ability to determine good versus bad that being represented in an individual and unable to be trained down to your second line leaders is virtually valueless in that this needs to be something that can be built and scaled upon and referenced in order for you to grow and i would guess that most of us on this call are in high growth companies where we have increasing expectations every single day and the only way to live up to those expectations of your investors that have just given you 50 million dollars is to improve your process and increase at the same time your level of visibility so you can make better strategic decisions. So the TLDR there is just build something and it doesn't matter that it's not 100% perfect, start measuring. And that hardest first step is to, I'm going to do a, a neologism here and just say, just datify the, the subjectivity. Put a scorecard in place that represents that rubric that you use if you're to to evaluate a call what are you looking at subjectively subjectively assign a grade assign scoring criteria even if there are only five questions on that start somewhere and then start honing it and uh, that data will be both extremely surprising and extremely insightful when you start to correlate it even yourself or with your frontline sales leaders against your wins and even those two pieces of data that don't require a dedicated data scientist or a RevOps team are going to enable you to start building the foundation of what success is and therefore teaching and replicating it. Mm -hmm. I, did you want to add something there, Dave? You know what I was going to say, Karen, is I, I think um, one of the things that I, I know we wanted to leave the audience with today is some real tactical tips on of the thousands of calls that we reviewed and scored, what makes the difference in a good discovery, uh, a good uh, demo, uh, a good close. And um, I'm thinking, I know we had a couple other polls planned. Why don't we skip those? We'll make it about the audience. Why don't we go to that last poll where we ask for the group that's on here, let's spend the next 20 minutes workshopping whatever you want to workshop. Like, at, And so I think we have a poll that we'd like to jump onto here pretty quick, which is like, you know, specifically if the way we spend the rest of our call today, um, would you like it to be on discovery, demo, or closing? And we'll we'll wait our our time accordingly. And you know, while we're waiting on that, why don't we see what questions people have about about this in the in the chat as well? This one's fun, Dave. It's it's almost like replays live. It is almost like replays live. I missed that. We got to do that again. Too. <laughs> This is great. Well, again, this is for you, right? So we're going to go where you want us to go. Um, just to build off Keith's point is the correlation. It, it, in the absence of a scorecard, we can't correlate what, what's working and what's not, right? So this kind of ties us into here. Wh where do we focus within the discovery? There's there's many areas. And if we don't know where we're, we're missing the point, we don't know where to focus to get better. So it looks like uh, we're the, still going, but so far, 83% are looking to focus in the discovery which for me makes sense. Yeah. I think uh, hard to get to close when you're not opening. <laughs> well, let's let's do it. Why don't we dive into discovery? I'm happy to start off and share a couple tips. Okay, so why don't we start by, yeah, sharing it within the discovery. Do you wanna share, uh, Dave, what those who are perhaps getting past that first meeting and advancing what, what they're doing well? Yeah, and and so um, the, the the top things we see in general um, before we go to discovery, then like the top 
five or six key things that we find differentiate deals that move forward, but deals that don't are asking for a next meeting on the books at the end of a call. Um, and a lot of reps aren't doing an effective job of that consistently. That, that assumes, of course, that there's general interest and in, in someone wants to move forward, but just specifically asking at the end of the call, hey, well, um, you know, we really find it helpful for our prospects if we have a placeholder call uh, set for a couple of days from now so we can answer any questions. And you'll find that, I don't know, 80% plus the time they'll say yes. Uh, that was a key predictor time and again from top reps to the rest of the crowd. Another was at the end of the demo, specifically asking, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. You know, you'd think it would be a no brainer question, but um, it's not. And, and, then, um, and then of course, really tying into discovery, understanding the second level pain, understanding what is current state, what's future state, you know, painting that picture of the Delta in between, and then not wasting their time with the prospects time with, you know, um, the, the standard PowerPoint that you do for everyone, really customizing your demo time with them to the, the key areas that they've said are keeping them up at night. Um, those were a, a few of the, the real key differences between, and, and you know what, one other one, which was interesting is we um, reps team to seem, tend to get robotic after a while. And when they're doing, especially in a higher transactional kind of scenario where they're doing the demo multiple times per week, and uh, but that actually was a predictor of whether the uh, deal moved forward or not. It was when a rep actually takes the time to make it um, super, like it's the first time they're doing it and being just super interested in the and, in, and intently listening to the person that they're um, engaged with and not rushing through their content and not feature, just going feature benefit, feature benefit, but really understanding what makes you know, what the prospect cares about, what their pain point is, how can we actually help them? And then, and then finally using customer stories. I think we all know that, but we found that the magic number of customer stories in a 45 minute uh, call isn't one, it's not two, it's three customer stories. And that includes with, with solid ROI evidence in there as well. So those, um, you know, those are some pearls right there. If, if you're on this call and you're a sales rep, um, or if you just implement those six things and do them very, very well, I don't know if it was six, but somewhere around there, um, uh, then I think you would have got your money's worth for your, your time on this call. And, um, and if you're a sales leader, I really recommend that as you're looking at your framework, ask yourself, is this in my framework? Do my sales reps know to use customer stories um, you know, a few times in a call and, and, and to make them ROI driven? Do they ask for that next meeting on the books? Um, and for sales managers, Really, you know, challenge yourself to, uh, in your next meeting with your team, uh, role play this and, and watch your team do it and have them share best practices. I'm sure, hey, we've got a very sophisticated audience here. Um, and, and so uh, I'm sure a lot of this stuff's already being done. But the reason we called it a masterclass is we get, you know, to share with you what we've seen after thousands of calls. And those are, you know, we'll dive into discovery in a sec, and, and, but those are some of the things. Uh, and Keith, sorry, I, I don't mean to be taking up all the time here. What would you add to that? <laughs> no problem. I will hop in and say my four or five will be critical too. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's see. Karen, how hard is this to think through this without saying the words replays best practices? <laughs> <laughs> it's almost <laughs> impossible. <laughs> we'll <dub you> out. <laughs> so, so, all right, I'll, I'll give my four or five and I'll probably need the cane to drag me off stage on this one, but, but let's go. Yeah, so yeah. number one is focus on the fundamentals. And I see way too many experienced reps start to go off piste and forget the very fundamentals that are foundational to a good discovery call. Checking time, setting a good agenda, showing you did your research, actually checking for buy-in with this agenda, doing introductions, introducing yourself, finding out who's on the call. If you haven't met this person before, calling them out, involve everyone on the call. Nothing I just said is insightful to anyone on this call, and yet you'll see many of these founda foundational fundamental pieces start to drop, especially in the experienced reps, because they start to get confirmation bias on some of their calls that went well, and they drop the fundamental pieces. So ensuring that you're focusing on the basics, number one, even with your most tenured reps, is really, really important. Number two, lead with value. In our post-COVID sales era, your buyer is not looking for the living embodiment of a product brochure. If they wanted that, they could go to the website and go to the products page. They don't need it. 
what your BDR did or what your inbound marketing team did is they built the banner ad either quite literally or figuratively. You are that piece of content. And if your account exec is going to come on and qualify your outbound prospect as if this was an inbound lead and you're going to lead before you say anything with BANT questions, guess what? You are not going to have a sale and it is not your BDR's fault that that lead goes nowhere. It's yours. And I know that's a hard truth and AEs everywhere are cursing my name right now, but sorry. It, it is your imperative to actually incent and provide the reason as to why this individual should be interested and should be spending time with you. Lead with the value, actually provide some information for free. Teach this person something and they will pay attention to you. Moving on, actually pay attention to your polish and presence. And in the sales zeitgeist right now, there are a, a few of these unconscious utterances, I always say, the likes, kindas, you know, ums, and for whatever reason, they're becoming so much more prevalent, perhaps because we're all living on Zoom right now and we've settled in and Zoom has become a normal modality of conversation. So we're very comfortable and possibly too comfortable on these web conferences and we've become overly conversational. Your buyer is looking at you as an expert and the more you show that you're just winging it and you don't have a prepared narrative and you're walking perfectly this fine line between providing value and synthesizing information. If you're just coming up with it on the spot and thinking through it and making stuff up that appears not that valuable, well, your prospect isn't going to find it that valuable either. Next one. I feel like we're doing the, the hot list here. Next. So next one is actually have an opinion. And I find this to be one of the most challenging ones for AEs is there is fear of perhaps being too confrontational and actually making a suggestion. And I'm not necessarily advocating, although it's great for full challenger sale and telling your buyer they, they're not intelligent. You don't have to do that. You don't have to insult them. You don't have to be deliberately contentious for the sake of starting a fight. That's not the purpose. But remember, if your buyer knew the way, they would have already clicked buy it now. They don't know the way. They're there speaking with you to look for an informed opinion to help them shape their own informed opinion. They want an opinionated salesperson to take a stand. And that stand is not yesing and agreeing with everything they're saying. It's providing them new information and context that they don't necessarily have yet. Be opinionated. Don't apologize. Don't tentatively provide a suggestion and at the same time give an escape valve to your prospective buyer and say, well, if that's okay with you, I'd like to. No, ask your question, provide the value, provide the contrarian opinion that is synthesized based upon your customer stories. That's what they're there for. I think that's in my good mic drop. That was great mic drop. That was the passion was just coming out of you there. Good job, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> Once you wind me up, it's hard for me to settle back down. All right, well, that was 10. That was like the top 10, if we could, <laughs> That, that's got to be somewhere. So this call is recorded, but we got to highlight that. And I would encourage you all, both sales leaders who don't have a framework, who aren't coaching, there's a starting point right there. And it's kind of throughout the sales process. And I would also invite sales reps who are trying to better themselves. Like these are, you know, a lot of times what I see is people are looking for this new shiny, what can I do differently? And a lot of it is back to the basics, back to the fundamentals. And some of the points that Keith just said, it's just, are you setting an agenda? If there's multiple stakeholders on, are they introducing yourself? Are you getting equal talk time from everybody? So our role is to create an experience for our customer. And when we're showing up and phoning it in and winging it, not only are we cre we're creating an experience, but not the one they're looking for, but we also continue to bring the profession of sales down. And so I, I think it, you know it's incumbent upon us to really look at things from our customer's lens. And I always say the currency we trade in is time. And so when they're getting on a call with you, whether it's a discovery or demo, what are they thinking? What are they hoping? What are they feeling? So how can you kind of align yourself with how they're coming in? If they're already thinking, here we go, another demo, I'm going to be spoken to, I'm going to be death by PowerPoint. How can you be different and not be that person? And kind of just, they're going to, they're expecting it. And then they're like, oh, wow, they actually asked about me. They're not monopolizing the screen. You know, they're, they're telling some stories, all these things 
you're going to create a completely different experience. You're going to make it easy for them to buy from you because you're different. You're standing out and you're not really different. You're just going back to the fundamentals that we've moved away from. And whether that's because we remote, then we kind of started moving back and we're oscillating. We really haven't landed on where we're going to land, but some things are tried and true and they will always be. And those 10 things that, that Keith and Dave just shared, in my opinion, are fundamentals that are timeless. Before we move on, I, out of those 10, and you might've taken notes, you might've not, I, I'd invite you both sales leaders and sales reps, what's one of them that you're perhaps not doing now, but you're like, after this, man, I'm gonna start doing that. So right in the chat box, what's the one that's fired you up? That's like, oh, I forget to do an agenda. Or I gotta introduce more storytelling, you know, connect on the emotional part. So in the chat box, let us know what one will you put into practice after hearing those 10 takeaways? And while we're waiting for that, um, have an opinion, be confrontational. And even confrontational might be a strong word, but, but a polarizing message. You know, we want to repel those who are almost disqualify those who are not in line with us, right? But definitely, what do you stand for? Because as Keith said, that's what they're looking for. If they could do it themselves, they would. They wouldn't need you. They wouldn't be on the call. So they're looking to you for your expertise, but also based on what you shared with them. So if this is what I heard. This is how I've helped others like you. So you kind of bring them on the journey. And this is that future state. Um, so great. Have an opinion. Become synthesizing value around customer stories. Yes. Not one, but multiple customer stories. Adding value. Use customer personal stories. Yes. Um, what was the question here? Any tips framework for telling really good stories? Now I know Dave Kennett has a great framework here. So Dave, <laughs> would you like to um, share that with Charles in the group? Yep, you bet. And then I'm dying to share the top discovery things because we promised the team Ooh, we'd do that. Yes. I've, got a, I've got a slide I want to show everyone. Oh, the top. Well, we'll but, give you a minute for this then. <laughs> okay, uh, Charles, thanks for asking that. Um, if you can hit me up on LinkedIn later, I'll drop my LinkedIn profile here in a bit and I'll, I'll give you an actual framework. Um, we call it the what, so what in the customer story all in under a minute. So the idea is this, there's three things that sales reps typically blunder on customer stories. Uh, number one, they don't say them. <laughs> uh, number two, they say them, but they just spent, they, they just mentioned a brand. Oh, we work with IBM. That's not a customer story. We call it an oblique customer reference. The third is they'll share a customer story, but they'll actually like make it five minutes long and you waste four valuable minutes that you didn't have to use. So make it under a minute. Um, and when I say what, so what in customer story, when you hear that, so I'll put it in the context of replace call coaching. When I hear someone say, I just don't have time to call coach. Uh, the what is uh, we can help you free up time in your calendar um, and, and help your, your team improve their win rate. Uh, the so what is um, this will help grow sales significantly within the next three months. The customer story is, hey, that reminds me of Vidyard. We've been working with them for two and a half years. When they first came to us, someone in your role actually had the exact same challenge. Fast forward today, they've had uh, dramatic growth year over year. We coach their team every handful of weeks and, um, and um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's just a, a real quick me on fast forward, uh, giving you um, an example of how we tell a customer story. So the what, you know, what is the, what is the pain? The, so what, what's the differentiator that helps the pain and the quick customer story, the customer story should include the logo that, you know, cause that gives credibility. If you're just like, Oh, one customer one day, people will be like, yeah, yeah, you're a salesperson. You're making it up. Like give them a brand. And it was, you know, specifically Dan Wardle at uh, Vidyard who I first spot, spoke with, they can actually Google and say, Oh, okay. Dan's a person at Vidyard. Dave must be telling the truth. And when they first came to us two years ago, they had this problem. Okay. They, this person identifies with my problem. I now identify with replays because of it. And we help them with their win rate and improve by blah. Oh, wow. There's actually a quantifiable solution there. Those are the things that we see customer stories using. We call it a customer story framework. Um, and we've, we've got it in our replays masterclass, uh, actually, which I'm going to be giving everyone half off on at the end of this. So I'll, I'll uh, see, like, I don't know what it is after discount, but like a hundred and I don't know, 50 bucks or something. So, um, we'll plug that later on. Anyway, okay. hopefully that was helpful. That was good. A little over a minute, but I'll forgive you. So the what, so one, the customer story. Yeah. So I know we're going to do a quick audience activity, but before that, Dave, is there a slide you wanted to share that ties in with, uh, with what we're chatting about now? 
Yeah, and I hate slides. I don't, I don't recommend using them in presentations, but for this, I wanted to synthesize um, what we have saw across all of the calls we've been scoring are the top things in discovery that reps aren't doing well and can do better. One is asking a consequence question. You know, what if you don't do anything and the situation gets worse over the next three to six months? What a fantastic question. What a fantastic question. It really helps people understand like, okay, if I don't move forward, what's gonna happen? Um, you know, what's the things that stop you from doing something like this at this point? Um, did you actually quantify the problem? You know, did you really take a minute to understand, if, again, using our call coaching analogy, hey, you don't have time to call coach. Um, you know, we know that when someone gets call coached, they improve their win rate by three to 8% in the first three months. Do you think that's the cost to you? Have you quantified that before? And actually coming up with, you know, the cost or opportunity cost of, of that problem. Uh, so that those are some of the, the quick discovery things, obviously, making sure you're getting to um, that, that real true pain. Most people start, start at su surface level, and a lot of people aren't adjusting their style to and, and their questioning to the persona. They're treating, uh, if they're selling something into sales, they're treating it like they're uh, selling to an individual contributor, the same as selling to a CRO of a, a Fortune 500 company. And, and it's like, what does that CRO care about? What is it? And I know a lot of this is repeat for a lot of folks on this call. Um, but for some of you, it, it, that may be something to, to think about. So really not having, if you've got 10 questions you normally ask in discovery, well, what are the three that you make sure you ask when a CRO is on versus a CFO versus a a CMO, really customizing. I think those are great points. And that's just above the line and below the line and the risk of, um, you know, even if you rank the questions, some of them are higher, higher bite if you don't, if you don't ask them like that risk of doing nothing. Sometimes it's nothing. And other times it's, you know what, it's significant. So you need to ask that, that question. Mm -hmm. um, now, what we're going to do quickly is because, you know, you've all said discovery is a main point that you wanted to understand a little bit of how we can get better, both from a sales rep as well as leaders. How can I better coach my team? So what we're going to do is we're going to invite somebody. If somebody wants to raise their hand, Samantha will bring them up into the panel and they can share uh, within one or two minutes uh, a discovery that perhaps went not in their favor and get some coaching as to what they could have done differently or just kind of walk them through the thought process of, um, of what happened, why it happened, and again, how can they prevent it from happening in the future? So do we have any volunteers? And if you're not, if we don't have any brave souls here, please, uh, you can also share in the chat box the situation. And we're happy to give you some expert coaching uh, for yourself. And I'm sure it's going to help others on the call. Cause I'm sure it's, if, if it's happened to you, it's probably happened to everyone else at some point. Yeah. Hopefully we can get someone who's going to jump in and help us do a little five minute workshop here. Yeah. To finish off the call. Any left turn that any of your calls took, I mean, sure. Specific to discovery, but if it just happens to be at the end of a call or a demo, we'll, uh, we'd love to dive into that as well. Or, or something that happened to one of your friends. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Asking for a friend. <laughs> So what are they supposed to, if they want to be chosen, do they just say like, yes? Just raise your hand. Okay. Raise your virtual hand. And Sam, you can let us know if you have anybody. While we're, while we're waiting on that, uh, Karen, I just dropped a link to my, um, my LinkedIn in there. If you have any other questions that you want to ask, and you maybe didn't want to ask it in this forum, just ping me, happy to answer you. Um, and to uh, the question earlier, that Charles had regarding our, our customer story framework, that's in our masterclass where we've got a hundred best practices and videos and stuff. And that's usually 296 bucks, but it's half price if you if you sign up and you're part of this crew, just use that discount code there. Uh, but anyway, that's enough. Um, no more advertisements from replays today. That's it. But don't we have someone that's going to put up their hand? I'm disappointed. Come on, someone. All right. Well, let's, let's why don't we then just, uh, if we're not going to have anyone, we can still go into some best practices for everyone here. Yeah, so why don't we start in the discovery and uh, the, the, the list of 10 that you both shared is kind of a mix of everything. So is there anything in the discovery that you would say is a definite no-no? Go ahead, Keith. Do you want to go first? Sure. I will say letting the buyer steer next steps. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to buy. In all likelihood, they haven't purchased before. 
So one of the, the most ineffectual things is that question that seems to recur frequently. What do you think would make sense for us to do next? It's one of the, the worst pieces of steering because inevitably, what is that buyer going to say? Let me go speak with my CFO and I'll get back to you. Mm -hmm. And it really is imperative, again, along that theme of you being the expert and them relying on you to tell them what to do suggest the next step that makes most sense in all likelihood it's probably going to adhere to some phase of your pre-designed sales cycle but suggest the next step logically that's going to help them on this decision making path don't ask them how to make a decision for something they've in all likelihood never purchased before it, it just it goes against sense mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we need to sell the process and do the heavy lifting for them. Otherwise, like you said, why are they here? Um, Dave, what about something we should be doing? So we're leaving them with some positives. Yeah, well, um, it ties to what I was going to say they shouldn't be doing. because uh, So it's going to be a negative and a positive. I'm, we're just not actually seeing people do discovery. <laughs> They'll ask one or two questions and they get into their demo. And um, those reps could be doing probably, uh, probably improve their win rate by 10% if they just do an effective job of it. So actually doing discovery, spending, you know, of course, if it's a transactional sale and you've got someone on for half an hour and let's say it's an inbound generated lead, because as Keith pointed out, it's different if it's an outbound generated lead, but if it's inbound, you know, you should be spending five to 10 minutes on discovery in that 30 minute call. If it's more a mid market to larger sale, maybe a 50 K ACV and a 45 day close, you should be doing 20 minutes to half an hour of discovery minimum. And, um, and, and really then customizing your demo. If your demo's, ha demo's half an hour um, or your presentation, if you've done a half hour discovery, you might be able to make your demo or presentation 15 minutes because they might, you know, if you're selling A, B, C, D, and E and they just care about A, well then just talk about A, you know, for 80% of the time. So I think, um, I think honestly, my answer is do discovery because <laughs> people just honestly are not doing it. Um, they're, they're, they think they are by asking a couple questions during the demo, but they're really not. Along the same spirit, Dave, I'll augment that and I'll give a do and a do not. And uh, that was Yoda style, right? So <laughs> the, the key there is another do not is that interjection at the end of a point you've just made that says, do you have any questions? Don't do that and it is so commonly used and almost inevitably and it's actually really funny so i would encourage any leader that's doing call coaching to pay attention to this one i see it all the time a rep will ask the question do you have any questions the buyer will instantaneously say no and then proceed to ask a question <laughs> and it's very very funny because they're just so conditioned to not do normal sales tropes or paradigms here nope don't have any questions but can you tell me you just went into a little bit on this and i'd like to hear a little bit more <laughs> steer the conversation and the best way to do that is to make this check-in meaningful replays best practice and the way to make a check-in meaningful of course in my vision is to take this buyer and put them into prospective future realm where they've already adopted this product. It's the line of thinking that you need to steer them to and put them in act as if realm. What does that world look like when they already have your product? What are the ramifications? What are the implications? What's changed? What does that look like? What is this going to enable? What is this going to unlock? And this is going to dramatically shorten that curve of this prospective buyer actually understanding what this means and you're going to help them get there through this guided questioning path that doesn't say do you have any questions but you're you're asking about a prospective future state hey john you mentioned that you're not coaching your reps right now we're seeing about a 10 percent improvement across the board from our teams in close rates that are coaching could you see that same change actually happening across your team well, yeah, I, I certainly could. What does that mean if you're able to take that close rate and go up to 35% as opposed to 25%? Yeah, I think those are really, really valid points. Uh, and again, meaningful check-ins. So I'm going to add one last one before we close off. Does this make sense? Not a check-in. <laughs> we are programmed to say yes. Okay, so if you're trying to get information on them, not going to do that. Now we have one minute left, so I want to thank all the sales leaders, um, the sales reps that have joined us today. You have a great understanding. You have minimum 10 
10 best practices that you can put in place to create your own framework where you can start really getting data and incorporating it into your sales culture to you know, increase performance and grow your team and retain your team at the same time. Uh, 30 seconds, last final words, Dave, at 30 seconds, what do you want to leave with? I just really enjoyed this. I want to, uh, thanks for hosting, Karen. And, um, and uh, Keith, thanks for joining. And everyone, I uh, really appreciate you taking the time with us today. Love to hear from you on LinkedIn if you have any other questions. That's all I got. And thank you to Sales Hacker for, uh, for hosting this. We love Sales Hacker. They're amazing. Keith, 30 seconds. No plugs for me. Uh, I'm here for replays. Dave, thanks for having me on. It was great. Loved the forum. Also, if anyone does have any questions from that sales executive perspective, please do find me on, on LinkedIn. Same thing. I'll drop my, my URL in the chat. Don't hesitate to ping me to elaborate on anything. As you all have seen, I tend to get passionate about these topics. So very, very happy to put more education and knowledge out in the world. Awesome. Thank you. And again, thank you to Sam and the sales hacker team. We had a blast. Thanks so much, everybody.